بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونعوذ به من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا نشهد شهادة حق انه لا معبود بحق إلا إياه ونشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وعزيزنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله Dear brothers, dear sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته this time we are meeting as we did last week in this the last week was last Juma was the last in the month of Sha'ban this Juma is the first in the month of Ramadan and our expectation and hope is that our presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more intense and more fervent during this season of approaching Allah with our hearts, with our souls, with our minds, and with our bodies all combined together. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to learn from the words, the precious words that He has revealed to us. For within the meanings of these words is a history that we are expected to learn from. And as those of you who have been following these series of presentations, we are focusing our attention on our history. But the history of Beni Israel is our history. That is why they are mentioned in the Quran. If they were some alien people, if they were some distant population, we probably would not be reading these ayat. These ayat would not be in the Qur'an. But because a particular people belong to many prophets of Allah, Ta'ala hikmatuhu we are duty-bound to learn from those who preceded us because they made some terrible mistakes. And Allah does not want us to repeat those terrible mistakes. So we will pick up from the last ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah that we were visiting the last time around. That ayah was ayah number 106. مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Just to give last, the last, week, last week, I cited uh, a nasikh and a mansukh incident that is mentioned here in the Qur'an, actually in this surah, and that had to do with the qibla. I will uh, mention a couple of other instances in the Qur'an where we encounter a nasikh and a mansukh. 
an ayah that supersedes a previous ayah. Uh, one of those ayat has to do with uh, <coughs> inheritance. Oh, well, before that, it has to do with adultery. If at the beginning of the revelation of this Qur'an, in those initial years, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed the Muslims on how to deal with those who commit adultery. And the ayah in this particular instance mentions the adulteress. And the ayah says, يَأْتِينَ الْفَاحِشَةَ مِنْ نِسَائِكُمْ فَأَشْهِدُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ أَرْبَعَةً or فَأَشْهِدُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ أَرْبَعَةً فَإِنْ شَهِدُوا فَأَمْسِكُوهُنَّ فِي الْبُيُوتِ حَتَّى يَتَوَفَّاهُنَّ الْمَوْتِ أَوْ يَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُنَّ سَبِيلًا Okay, <clears throat> what is this ayah saying? Let's uh, present its meaning in the English language. It says, And those of your women who have committed a fahisha, by the definition of probably the majority of Mufassireen, the word Fahisha is a, a Fahisha is a moral sin, a flagrant moral sin, Fahisha. So the A is saying those of our those of those women who belong to an Islamic order to an Islamic community, better yet, community, who commit such a flagrant moral sin, then they should be فَأَمْسِكُوهُنَّ They should be arrested. And then there has to be four witnesses that testify to the flagrant moral sin interpreted by most of the Mufassirin as adultery. They should be detained after, after being, uh, after the witnesses witness against them. Now, remember here, this the f the flagrant the the publicly exposed act of adultery is not something that takes place in a in a secret location or behind closed doors where no one can see whoever is committing that moral sin. And that's that's why the word al-fahisha is used and not the word al-zina. Because there's a word for adultery. It's a Quranic word. It's called zina. But in this case, because the zina is a flagrant public act and in the society in the pre-Islamic society there were um, different methods of illicit sexual relationships one of the methods, it's, it's equivalent, remember we're speaking about the Arabian Peninsula here, we're not speaking about other parts of the world. 
Some of this may apply to other parts of the world. Some of it may not apply. They may have had a more sophisticated way of, of uh, either legalizing or uh, accepting as a matter of culture illicit sexual rela relationships. So just to mention a couple of these um, fawahish. Fawahish is the plural of fahisha. One of them would be uh, a wife cannot have children, cannot conceive. <clears throat> and there's, an, there's attempts by the husband and wife to have a child. And this goes on for months and years and no success. So what the husband says to his wife, go, and it's basically saying, I permit you, I give you permission to go and have sex with, and then he choose one of the um, uh, famous or well-known or well-recognized men in society. He doesn't want her to go and have sex with just anyone to have a child. He wants that child to have a, an honorable ancestry. So he tells his wife to go and have sex, to conceive with, and then he'll give her the name of that particular, let's say, celebrity in society, well-known, recognized person in society. And then she'll go and solicit sex from that particular person, and then she becomes pregnant. That was one form or expression of al-fahisha. Another form of a, or expression of al-fahisha is, and it's equivalent to what we have in today's world, and that's prostitution, out-and-out out prostitution. But in that society, a prostitute was known by hanging a particular cloth, let's say a piece of cloth that is red, on her door or somewhere on her residence, window or something like that. That was a sign that uh, she, this person is a prostitute inside that house. There's a prostitute. And uh, if a man is passing by and uh, he wants to have sex and he sees that, and he's sort of familiar probably with who is in that particular place. He goes and he have sex, has sex and probably in all likelihood pays for that act. So these were the fawahish, including al-fahisha also includes the zina, where two individuals have sex in some place that is hidden from the public eye. Whatever the case may be, and we are not here particularly to go into uh, some of these details about al-fahisha and al-zina, but uh, in this particular area, at the beginning of establishing an Islamic community, a nucleus Islamic society, Allah is instructing the Muslims in this area to bring forward four witnesses who can testify in a court of law that they saw uh, this particular act of um, illicit sex take place. And if that is the case, and that can be established in a court of law, then 
the woman who has committed that uh, flagrant moral violation, that fahisha, would be sentenced to detention in her own house until death overtakes her or until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds a way out for her. <coughs> now, we all know that later on, as the Qur'an was being revealed, the punishment for an adulterer and an adulteress is to whip them in public. Uh, so this initial area of detaining someone followed by, and this is the mansukh area, followed by the nasikh area, which is to have them punished by flogging in public. So this is a demonstration of nasikh and mansukh. Now, the question here between those because there are two, uh, two minds that are thinking about understanding these ayat of Nasikh and Mansukh. There are those who say that the, the penalty of flogging or whipping the adulterer and adulteress in public is final. So from now, from, from here on, Anyone who commits this type of act has to be flogged. That's one uh, understanding of al nasikh and al mansukh the ayat that were revealed initially and the ayat pertaining to a certain verdict or judgment. And then ayat, ayah or ayat that followed that that overruled the initial ayah. So the other thinking through of these ayat and nasikh and al mansukh is no. The initial ayah stays, but it is applicable to an Islamic order that's in the making. The Islamic order still did not reach the moral level when the overwhelming majority of people in the Islamic society have, become, have reached a certain moral level, then the final ayah comes and cancels the first ayah. But the cancellation of it is meant to be understood of any society, any time, and anywhere in the world that has to go through the same steps. So that sort of summarizes uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means by al nasikh and al mansukh in the Quran. There's uh, another. There are three or four other ayat in the Quran that fit into the description of al nasikh and al mansukh, and we're not here to cover all of this. Obviously, there are other ayat in the Quran. We take as another example uh, the problem of addiction. Uh, some people who are addicted to narcotics or to alcohol or whatever, whatever other substance abuse there is out there. We realize in the Qur'an 
that to uh, free a person from addiction, there are certain stages you go through. And those ayat in the Qur'an are mentioned stage by stage until finally the, the individual and beyond that society itself gets rid of the addiction problem. So in, in that sequence of ayat we also have nasikh and mansukh. Okay, so I think now we will, <clears throat> after refreshing or enriching our information about the previous uh, lesson last week, we will go on to ayah number 107. أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا لَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ مِنْ وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Do you, O Prophet, not know that to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth, and that you don't have besides him a wali or a nasir? <clears throat> what is the meaning of wali? A wali is a person who likes you and favors you. And Nasir is a person who helps you and supports you. So besides Allah, we, the committed Muslims, we have no Wali and no Nasir. And Allah is specifically phrasing this meaning by addressing the Prophet and by extension addressing all of us. أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا لَكُمْ You see, in, in the first sentence, this, let's say this ayah is two sentences. It said in the first sentence says, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ so he's speaking to one person, and that is the Prophet. He, he doesn't say in this first sentence, Alam ta'lamu, do you, the committed Muslims, not know that to Allah belongs the uh, domain of the heavens and the earth? He says, Alam ta'lam, to the Prophet. And then he follows that immediately in the same ayah, the second sentence that follows, وَمَا لَكُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ مِن وَلِيٍّ وَلَا نَصِيرٍ And you, the committed Muslims, do not have, besides Allah, anyone who loves and favors you and helps and supports you. Now, if we go back to the previous ayah, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ The uh, ayah 106, the ayah of the Nasikh and Mansukh, which we just left, it says, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ Do you not know, O Prophet, that Allah has the capability of doing anything and everything he wants to do. And here Allah is saying, Alam Talam Anna Allaha Lahu Mulku Samawati Wal Ard. So we have the same type of sentence. One of them has to do with Allah's ability. That's the first the first sentence in Ayah 106. And then in Ayah 107, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Here the Ayah is telling, telling us that Allah has possession of the dominion of the heavens and the earth. So these are 
these are two um, contexts. The first one is that Allah has the capacity to do whatever He wants to do. The second one is that Allah has the possession of everything. And both of these go together. They, they complement each other. Let's step back a little to understand this and come to our human context. You, you can find someone who can do a lot of things. Whatever that person wants to do, he can do. But he doesn't have everything. And you can come to another person who basically can buy anything, can possess anything he wants to possess. But he doesn't have the power to do whatever he wants to do. We, when, we, when we take that up a level and apply this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we understand that he is in possession of everything whether it is material or non-material, and he has the power over everything, whether it is material or non-material. Most of us, I'm not saying everyone, but most of us, we think that when someone has possession of things, he has possession of physical and material things. Oh, someone owns a car, or someone owns a house, or someone owns lands, or livestock, or these types of things. They own things. But not many of us, when we say, إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Because these two phraseologies, these two types of sentences, you will encounter them many times in the Qur'an. And as you read them and you try to understand them, it doesn't occur to many people with all of the effort to understand the meanings of these ayat, it doesn't occur to them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has possession of and is capable of uh, taking control of things that are not materialistic or physical. In Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Now, one of the uh, mashayikh, one of the scholars, he gives a, uh, an example of this and he says this will uh, conjoin the meanings of these two sentences. أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Okay, now to understand these meanings in real life and in real time, one of these uh, scholars puts it this way. This will help us understand. There was a person at night walking in the street somewhere and he realized that there is a patrol, let's see, some say some policemen or some sentries or some uh, private guards, whoever they were, they were walking down the street. So this person had a feeling inside, this, this is, these are the area where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. This person had a feeling that these sentries or guards or cops or call them whatever you want it, they were following him as if he is guilty of something. So he began to run away from them and he wound up 
hiding in a deserted room. Call it a garage, call it a depot, call it whatever. And these guards catch up with him. They enter this place and they find this person who ran away from them in there. Not only do they find this, this person who was afraid of them and running away from them, not only do they find him, but they find a dead body in that same room. So, they take him to court. And this person, of course, is innocent. He didn't kill anyone. He was just running away. He was actually running away from his fear when he saw those two, let's call them policemen, when he saw those two policemen trailing him, he was afraid. And unfortunately, this is what, this is what happens in today's world of law enforcement. Many people don't like policemen. They don't like cops. They don't like detectives. They don't like all of these individuals who are involved in law enforcement. It's almost like a common feeling in all societies of the world. No one is fond of these types of people. And I don't know if you're up to... Uh, uh, if you are following the news today, uh, what's happening here in the United States with the call of many people, and this is a very advanced, progressive, modern society, and there's a very significant voice out there, probably tens of millions of people who say they don't want police anymore in society. De-policing society. Anyways, sometimes innocent people have done nothing wrong at all. They have a hunch that they are being followed and then they want to just, and they're innocent, they have done nothing, just want to get get away from whoever is following them, whatever, wherever they may end up. So, this tells you, this speaks volumes about the relationship between those who are supposed to stand up for the law, who are in uniform, and the average person who's out there taking care of his day-to-day uh, business. Anyways, in this case, this innocent person was brought to a court of law. Before he was to appear in front of the judge, remember, we, I, I, I don't want you to lose sight of the meanings of these ayat that we are speaking about. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. I want you to have these ayat accompany you as I am going through the details of what's happening with this person. So he asks uh, the court to permit him to pray two rakahs before he faces his trial. And they give him the right to pray to Allah two rakahs. And in his prayer, you know, the Prophet of Allah says that any time an issue weighs down heavily on you, you feel extensive pressure, you feel that you, your 
freedom is going to be taken away. You feel that there is an imminent threat. إِذَا حَزَبَهُ أَمْرٌ This uh, description of the Prophet says that whenever an affair weighs heavily upon him, he goes to a salah, this communion with Allah Jalla wa'ala. So this person offers his two rakat and then he says a dua. He says, O oh Allah, you tell us, Wala taktumu shahada. Do not conceal any testimony. If a person, Allah is telling us, if any of you uh, have seen a transaction, a business transact, witnessed a business transaction, or seen a, any of you have seen a crime take place, you cannot, you are not allowed to conceal what you have seen. وَلَا تَكْتُمُ shahada. Okay. So this person in his dua is saying, Oh Allah, you tell us not to hide or conceal a testimony or an event that we have seen. I ask you, O oh Allah, do not conceal your testimony that I am innocent. I did not commit any crime. This person is asking Allah what Allah is asking us. This is if, if anything, this tells you how close a person has to be with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is demonstrated in the two rak'ahs and in the dua that he made. Now he's brought in front of the judge. As he is brought in front of the judge, at that moment, see, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ لَهُ مُلْكُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ At that moment, the person who committed the crime shows up in court and confesses to his crime. He says, I am the killer. At the same time that this happens, the son of the victim, the murdered person, shows up and says he is willing to forego the ransom, the penalty that is due upon the murderer. When these are things that happen when committed Muslims are in touch with Allah, how can, in the average person's mind, how can these coincidental things happen all at the same time? It's not because of who we are, it is because of who Allah Azza wa Jal is. And that's how these types of things happen. Alam ta'lam anna Allah lahu mulku samawati wal ard wa ma lakum min duni allahi min waliyin wala nasir. Listen closely to Allah's words. And you, the committed Muslims, besides Allah, you have no one who likes you and favors you and is on your side and no one who can aid you, support you and help you besides Allah. This is 
this applies to one individual and it applies to a collectivity of individuals to Islamic persons and to Islamic populations. Equally so, as long as we are with Allah. And we pray and we hope this month of Ramadan will bring us into the fervent meanings of these ayat. Then we go on to ayah 108, in which the words of Allah say, أَمْ تُرِيدُونَ أَنْ تَسْأَلُوا رَسُولَكُمْ كَمَا سُئِلَ مُوسَى مِنْ قَبْلِ وَمَنْ يَتَبَدَّلِ الْكُفْرَ بِالْإِيمَانِ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ Remember, these ayat are basically a, are shining a light on two mentalities and two groups of people. Those who are committed to Allah because they are with Allah's Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, and another set of people who had their own prophets, but they had a breakaway attitude and a separatist behavior from their prophets, from our prophets. And those are Bani Israel. So this ayah is saying, Am turiduna an tas'alu rasulakum kama su'ila Musa min qabl. This ayah is saying, or do you, the committed Muslims, are you entertaining the idea of posing questions to your messenger the way Musa was recipient of questions during his time? Am turiduna an tas'alu rasulakum kama su'ila Musa min qabl. Now, we had voices in the Arabian Peninsula outside of the community of committed Muslims who were behaving just like Bani Israel, but they did not commit themselves to Allah yet. Okay, we can understand that. لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى تَفْجُرَ لَنَا يَنْبُوعًا or to fajjira lana yanbu'a. We will not have confidence in you until you cause a gushing spring of water to come forward. Aw tusqita alayna samaa kama za'amta kisafa. Or another way we will consider believing in you is that you cause the sky to fall upon us in pieces. That was their understanding of the sky. Or, there's another choice you have, O Muhammad, to convince us of the validity of your message, and that is, to bring us Allah and bring us the Malaika right here in front of us, juxtaposed with us. أو يكون لك بيت من زخرف. Or, we're giving you another option for us to validate what you are saying. And that is, why don't you have a house, a gilded house, a house made of gold? That's another option we are presenting you. 
أو ترقى في السماء. Look, we're not short on options. They're telling the prophet, and there's another choice. You, you can go up to the skies. You can go up, ascend into the heavens. وَلَن نُؤْمِنَ لِرُقِيِّكَ حَتَّى تُنَزِّلَ عَلَيْنَا كِتَابًا And even if you do go up, we will not believe you until you bring down to us a book, a scripture. نَقْرَأُهُ That we can read. What was, what was the Prophet's reply to all of that? قُلْ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّي هَلْ كُنْتُ إِلَّا بَشَرًا رَسُولًا Exalted and extolled is my sustainer. But I am only uh, a human messenger, so to speak. That's all. Even if we learn from the history of Bani Israel, even if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to do all of these things for these people that they are asking, whether they are outside of Islam or whether they become Muslims and miracles are performed for them. These types of physical, material or materialistic miracles do not sustain a person's commitment to Allah. How many miracles were presented to previous Gener scriptural generations by Musa, by Isa, by other prophets of Allah and then after a, either a very short time or after an extended time period, not very long, a generation or two and then they go back to where they were, uncommitted to Allah. And there's an ayah in Surah Al-Isra that reminds us of this fact. The reason we, and this is in reference to Allah, Tabaraka wa Ta'ala, what has barred us from presenting miracles to them is the fact that those generations in times gone by who were presented with miracles, it was only a short time and then they contravened, they contradicted the purposes of those miracles. وَمَا مَنَعَنَا أَن نُرْسِلَ بِالْآيَاتِ إِلَّا أَن كَذَّبَ بِهَا الْأَوَّلُونَ Surah Al-Isra So didn't they, in, in the time of Isa alayhi salam, didn't they say that they wanted a, a table spread? مَائِدَةً مِنَ السَّمَاءِ هَلْ يَسْتَطِيعُ رَبُّكَ أَن يُنَزِّلَ عَلَيْنَا مَائِدَةً مِنَ السَّمَاءِ we have to think, we have to, you know, some of us know some of this information that I am expressing here, but we don't give it deeper thought. And this is what is required. We have to think deeply about these events and not marginalize them or consign them to uh, oblivion and then someone like me comes along and I say these words oh I knew that yeah knowledge is a cold thing in the mind but that knowledge has to be tempered and has to be warmed up with the hearts and the feelings that we have And one of the blessings and bounties of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there is no 
miracle that is centralized or paraded for the committed Muslims and for all other Muslims until the end of time during the lifetime of Allah's last Prophet alayhi wa alihi salatu wassalam there were miracles in the lifetime of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam there were miracles but we don't emphasize those miracles tune in to preachers and pastors and priests tune into them when they're speaking about their history their prophets their scripture their Lord, and they will emphasize miracles, like miracle. a miracle is the central issue around which everything else rotates. We don't have that. The Prophet, no doubt, had miracles performed, but it was not for the sake of winning over believers or committed Muslims. Al-Isra and Al-Mi'raj is a miracle, but we don't emphasize it as a miracle. And there are other miracles in his lifetime that took place at the battlefield and that took place at times of ease, but we don't emphasize the physical and material expressions or manifestations of those miracles. What we do emphasize is Allah's involvement in our willpower, in what we do. When Allah is involved in what we do, the consequences may become miraculous. And this is like a promise that came from Allah to the Prophet and to the committed Muslims with him. Allah says in an ayah, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ This ayah means that Allah is not going to cause them the inhabitants of Mecca, the inhabitants of al Medina, the inhabitants of al Hijaz, the inhabitants of Arabia, Allah is not going to cause them to suffer. Allah is not going to torment them as long as you, O Muhammad, are within them. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ And then, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ And Allah is not going to be a tormentor of them as long as they are asking Him for forgiveness, amnesty, Pardon. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ That is why no severe cataclysmic penalty came to those who were living in the time of Allah's Prophet and those who lived after the time of Allah's Prophet as long as they maintained a relationship of asking Allah for forgiveness. On the other hand, when Allah in previous scriptural generations and times when he produced miracles for those societies to have confidence and belief in Allah and his Prophet, when they 
disobeyed, the result of their disobedience was a cataclysmic existential result of devastation. So in Allah's mercy, as long as we maintain a relationship, a, a heartfelt relationship of asking Allah to forgive us, we will dodge that bullet of existential destruction. Then we come to the other ayah that follows. وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا حَسَدًا مِّنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِهِمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الْحَقِّ فَاعْفُوا وَاصْفَحُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ إن الله على كل شيء قدير. This ayah needs some time for us to absorb its meanings into the very fiber of our feelings and into the very molecules of our brains. So, I know it's, I only have a few more minutes left, but I'm going to begin uh, to explain this, and inshallah, in the coming week, we will follow up the meanings of this ayah. The first words in this ayah, وَدَّ كَثِيرٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ Many people belonging to the scripture of Allah exchange among themselves an affinity. What is this? First of all, before we speak about what this affinity is, we, we, we want to emphasize Allah's meticulous wording kathirum min ahl al-kitab many or most of people of scripture meaning Jews and Christians as they identify themselves many of them Allah did not say in the in this ayah which sometimes is the fast conclusion of some people. Allah did not say in this ayah, وَدَّ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَوْ يَرُدُّونَكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِيمَانِكُمْ كُفَّارًا He didn't say, people of scripture, Jews and Christians, have a shared affinity to cause you to rescind or renounce your commitment to Allah. He didn't say all of them. You see, we, we covered, there are, in, an, in, in the previous time we said ta'ifa. At other times, the, the, the point is here, don't generalize. Even though, the issue is clear that most of them have we tried to identify who most of them is here? Have we taken into consideration those right now who call themselves Christians and Jews who exchange this type of common feeling between them 
And this common feeling that they have is that we should turn our backs on this commitment to Allah. ود كثير من أهل الكتاب لو يردونكم من بعد إيمانكم كفارا. After you have committed yourselves to Allah, they want you to become deniers of Allah. This begs the question: Why? First of all, we have to identify who these are. Why can't our mind, Allah has given you and me and all of us a working mind. Why can't our mind take the, this meaning, clear meaning, this is a very explicit ayah, understand what it's saying to us and look at who are these many people who say they belong to the Torah or say they belong to the Gospel or say that they are of the Jewish faith, or say that they are of the Christian faith, why, for, who are they, number one, who are they? And then number two, what are their connections? What brings them together? If we wanted to take a step forward in this meaning, then we begin to discover that there are those who say that they are Jews, but their Judaism is eclipsed by their Zionism. Those who say that they are Christians, but their Christianity is eclipsed by their evangelical persuasion, which in and of itself is intertwined with the Zionist version of Jewish history. This is an area that our mind has to begin to move into. I have run out of time, but no one runs out of time when they are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We pray that this month of Ramadan will bring us closer and closer and closer to Him that His words will penetrate both our minds and hearts at the same time. We ask Him to forgive us our shortcomings and our discrepancies as well as our deficiencies. And we pray that we remain together as we remain with Him. وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد وترى الملائكة حافين من حول العرش يسبحون بحمد ربهم وقضي بينهم بالحق وقيل الحمد لله رب العالمين